Let us pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that we can gather together to study your word and be inspired by your word. Thank you that it speaks to us and that it's always relevant to our lives no matter when or where we live. And we pray that your Holy Spirit now will quicken your word or make it alive in our lives this morning. Help us to see what you're teaching us. Help us to see how that fits our particular circumstance and what you're calling us to do and who to be. And we pray, Lord, that through that we'd be able to live lives that are pleasing to you, that are honoring to you, and also share your truth and your love with others about Jesus' love. Father, guide us through your word now, we pray, and may my words be your words as we seek to learn and grow together. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Now, it's been said that there are two things you always avoid discussing in polite company. One is religion, and the other is politics. Well, we're not going to talk about just religion, and we're not going to talk about politics today. We are going to talk about one of God's great blessings we experience in this country. See, that is the freedom He gives each of us to choose who we want to lead us. Now, that may not seem remarkable to us this day and age in America, but I guarantee you that it was absolutely unheard of in the ancient world that people could rule themselves. And it is still unknown in many parts of the world today as small groups of people or tyrants control the lives of everybody in their nations. And yet, maybe familiarity breeds contempt, as they say, because it's a freedom we have that more than half of our eligible citizens will not exercise on election day on Tuesday. They won't bother to vote. Now there's a lot of bad teaching out there about Christians and voting, but I won't take the time to deal with that. The Bible actually has some answers for us about it. And since the Bible is our guide for life, let's just take a look a bit at what it's telling us. You see, it used to be that in schools, civics education was a very important Subject that everybody had to learn to understand how to be a citizen and how to practice that citizenship in America. But sadly, it's not essential to the curriculum anymore in many places. That was brought home to me just recently. Uh, a young man who's my third or fourth or fifth cousin, I can't remember exactly how, how close we are with that, met with me a few weeks ago. We were talking about family history and he's wanting to do some genealogy work and so on. And he, for a 17-year-old, he's amazing that he wants to do all this stuff, but he's, he's becoming an expert at it. And in the course of our conversation with him, I mentioned John Paul Jones. And he looked at me with a blank stare. He said, who's that? I said, you know, John Paul Jones, the father of the American Navy, the man who helped us win the Revolutionary War. He had no clue. Now, he goes to one of the better rated schools in this state. Do I blame him for not knowing who John Paul Jones was? No. Do I blame his teachers for not teaching him who John Paul Jones was? No, they have to teach the curriculum. The fault lies with the textbook writers and those who review them for approval that somebody that important to our nation's history is no longer being taught. Well, the truth of the matter is our founding fathers did have a bunch of advice from the Bible about what good, good government should look like. And for us, this should be part of our Christian faith. You see, if Christianity is something we only practice in church on Sunday morning, it's pretty worthless. 
If we live our lives for Jesus every day, and we think like Him, and we love like Him, that's living the Christian life. It's not saying, I'm going to put my Christianity back on the shelf after I leave church and leave it there until next Sunday morning rolls around. And during the rest of the week, I won't give the Lord any kind of acknowledgement. No, that's not Christianity. That's not what the Bible teaches us about our Christian faith. Paul said, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. That means all that we do, we need to do thinking and loving like a Christian. And that includes our role as citizens of this nation. God did provide a strategy for good government to his people. And it began with Moses. Our first passage today comes to us from Exodus 18, 19 to 26. Let's read through it briefly. This is Moses' father-in-law speaking to him, and God was speaking through him, of course. Now listen to me. I will give you counsel, and God be with you. You be the people's representative before God, and you bring disputes to God. Then teach them the statutes and the laws, and make known to them the way in which they are to walk and the work they are to do. Furthermore, you shall select out of the people able men who fear God, men of truth, those who hate dishonest gain, and you shall place them over, place these over them as leaders of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. Let them judge the people at all times, and let it be that every major dispute they will bring to you, but every minor dispute they will themselves judge. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this thing, and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure, and all these people also will go to their place in peace. So Moses listened to his father-in-law and did all that he had said. Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, leaders of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. They judged the people at all times, the difficult dispute they would bring to Moses, but every minor dispute they themselves would judge. In this passage, we see how Israel developed as a nation. You see, up until that time, Moses was trying to run the show by himself, and he was exhausted because everybody who had a problem always came to him, Moses, what shall I do? Moses, what shall I do? And he had, you know, with a couple million people under your under your uh, following, you, you just can't do it as one person. So Jethro says to Moses, you're crazy to try to do this all by yourself. Find people to do it. And he gave him a strategy that came from God to organize the people into larger groups, smaller groups, smaller groups, and the smallest group. And appoint leaders over each of them so that there would be different levels of governance to deal with various issues. Our founding fathers jumped on that idea, and that's why we have different levels of government today. You will not find FBI agents driving around Pottsville issuing parking tickets. The federal government doesn't worry about that. You might find Pottsville police officers driving around town issuing parking tickets, but then they're local, just as an example. So that division of government began with ancient Israel. Now, in this passage, we also see four qualifications for good leaders. Biblical qualifications of leaders. The first one, he said, is choose people who are able or capable. <clears throat> you want somebody who knows what they're doing. You want somebody who has the intelligence and the understanding of the job to be able to do it so they do it well. That only makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, you wouldn't want a teenage volunteer in a hospital performing heart surgery on you, would you? No, you want somebody to spend like a gazillion years in medical school who's an expert, who knows exactly how to fix your problems. So that's the first one. 
people who are capable of doing the job. The second one is those who fear God. And that basically means that they respect and they love God. Because they're putting their own lives in perspective. And they will do so as leaders. They'll know that the Lord is the source of all truth. The Lord is the source of all right and wrong. And the Lord is the one who can best guide them to be good leaders. <coughs> the third one is they need to be truthful. We don't want any liars to lead us because how can you trust them? You want people to speak the truth to you. Even if they tell you things sometimes you don't want to hear. Because at least you know they're not being deceptive and they're not being manipulative. And fourth, that they are honest or free from greed. You don't want to elect somebody to office who's only in it because they're going to make themselves rich at your expense. But somebody will truly be a public servant. So here are the four characteristics that God gave Moses in selecting leaders. Now Moses appointed the first group, but Israel's history after that, the people from the tribes elected their own leaders. Israel was unique at that point in the ancient world where the people were, under God's law, ruling themselves. A wonderful blessing of liberty that they had until they abandoned it and said, we want to have a king. And then their freedom just went... Well, the writer to Proverbs puts it this way. When the righteous increase, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, people groan. Obviously, Solomon, writing several hundred years after Moses, knew the history of both the good and bad leaders that Israel had from time to time. And when the righteous people were in charge, the nation prospered and the freedoms abounded. And when the wicked people ruled, everybody groaned because they lost their rights and they lost their wealth. Now let's move to the New Testament. The Apostle Paul gives this entire teaching about the role of government from Romans 13. And we have nowhere near the time to go through this in detail today. But let's just read through it and draw the basic points that he's trying to bring to our attention. He says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. <coughs> For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God and avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to God, to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this you also pay taxes for the authorities and ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. So this is what Paul is saying. The relationship between people and their rulers should be if we are good Christians. So let me break this down briefly. We'll talk first about what is he saying here is the responsibility of good leaders, and then what is the responsibility of good citizens. So let's start first. The civic responsibility of rulers. First of all, rulers exist to promote good behavior. That there is law and order. That there are ethics and morals in the nation. Because Paul understood very clearly that if a nation is corrupt, it won't survive. Second, rulers exist to punish evil. If there was no rule of law, it would be mob violence everywhere. Nobody would be safe. It would be like the French Revolution during the Reign of Terror when suddenly everybody pointed one person and said, that person deserves to die, and they took him out to the guillotine. 
And even some of the leaders of the revolution eventually suffered that fate because it was just the mob. There were no standards, there were no authorities. And third, rulers are ministers of God. See, just as God has placed leaders in the church, he has also created offices for government to guide that aspect of our lives too. And that is a calling from God as well, even though many people don't think of it that way today. Well, let's look at the other response, the civic responsibility of Christians or citizens, Christians who are citizens. Being in submission to rulers is part of our submission to God. The scripture never tells us that we should be anarchists, that we should just throw off all government and all rule and just do whatever we want. There has to be order in society or there's chaos. Second, rulers deserve our support financially. Now, granted, none of us likes paying taxes. And I wish I could say the government's very efficient in how they use our money, but sadly they aren't. But they deserve to be compensated for the time and effort that they put into executing their offices. And third, we are to give rulers all their due, our taxes, customs, duties, respect, and honor. So in, in a sense, he's saying Christians should be model citizens. We should have the highest respect for authority and be supportive of them. Now, there also is a fourth duty that's not mentioned here, but in another of Paul's letters. 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2, he says this. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. And that's the fourth responsibility we have to pray for our leaders. Pray that they do a good job. Pray that they protect our rights. Pray that God will bless them. We need to be their prayer support, lifting them up. And that's why as part of my Sunday prayer every week, I always pray for our leaders. It hasn't mattered to me who was in what office. All were appointed by God in one fashion or another, so we pray for them. So that's our responsibility very clearly from Scripture. Now, what about our history? Has that always been the case, that Christians have felt this way? Well, let me give you a couple quotes. First of all, this comes from Charles Spurgeon, who was an English Baptist preacher in the late 1800s. He's also known as the Prince of Preachers. He's one of the most famous preachers to ever preach. He said, every God-fearing man should give his vote with as much devotion as he prays. In other words, Spurgeon is saying, you need to be engaged, you need to think about your vote, and you must use the same level of commitment and concern for that as you do when you pray. And of course, Spurgeon was a huge believer in prayer. So that's part of our Baptist heritage right there, his position on that. Let me give you another one. Charles Finney was a revivalist preacher from the early 1800s. He's credited with being the main preacher for what's called the Second Great Awakening in America. It was a time in the first part of the 1800s, before the Civil War, where perhaps hundreds of thousands of people came to know the Lord. Revival spread all across the country. And you know where the biggest influences were seen? in both the Baptist and the Methodist churches. They exploded with revival during this time because of Finney's and other preaching. But he's the one who's given the historical credit for being at the forefront and probably one of the most powerful preachers that existed during the time. He said this, Brethren, our preaching will bear its legitimate fruits. In other words, if we preach like we should, we'll have fruit. He says, if immorality prevails in the land, the fault is ours in a great degree. If there is a decay of conscience, the pulpit is responsible for it. If the public press lacks moral discrimination, the pulpit is responsible for it. If the church is degenerate and worldly, the pulpit is responsible for it. If the world loses its interest in religion, 
the pulpit is responsible for it. If Satan rules in our halls of legislation, the pulpit is responsible for it. If our politics become so corrupt that the very foundations of our government are ready to fall away, the pulpit is responsible for it. Let us not ignore this fact, my dear brethren, but let us lay it to heart and be thoroughly awake to our responsibility in respect to the morals of this nation. Finney understood the Christian church is responsible for pro proclaiming God's truth, for speaking it to the entire nation. And if we aren't doing our job by engaging that, then we're denying what God's called us to do and be. And again, this isn't some new idea that was just made up. Finney prepared the hearts of the nation for one of our bloodiest, ugliest periods of history, the Civil War. And if there hadn't been that great awakening where many people came to Jesus to prepare the nation for what lay ahead, we may not have survived as a nation through that war. He understood. And his words still echo today. The psalmist puts it this way, Psalm 11.3. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? If we no longer have moral underpinnings for this society, we will not survive. No nation in history ever has. Why do we think we're going to be any different? So let's repeat again what Solomon told us. When the righteous increase, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, people groan. In our type of government, we, the people, choose what kind of government we get, for good or for bad. That's the blessing God gave us. The righteous can increase or the wicked can rule, depending on whether or not we vote and who we select. It's that simple. And we all have that choice to make again this week. We can participate in God's blessing to us and help decide who rules us. Or we can ignore the Bible's advice to us and continue to lose the freedoms we have. If our voices aren't heard, there will be other voices. That's why I brought that voter guide in last week. That's why there are more back there. Again, they do not tell you who to vote for. They simply give you information. Here are the candidates. Here where they stand on the issues so that you can vote intelligently. I know everybody's TVs and mailboxes have been filled with all kinds of political stuff for the last, what, month. And everyone is saying, go this way or go that way. That's not what this does. This simply says, here are a number of issues. Here are the candidates running. Here's where they stand. And that's why it's a, a benefit for us as citizens. And that's why I distribute them. Again, they're nonpartisan. So, the choice is ours. Let us stand for freedom. Let us do our part to keep freedom going in this nation and in this world. Let's make sure that all of these kids that were sitting here in their lifetime never have to worry about what I talked about. That one day somebody will grab a hold of them and say, you're going to prison because you said you love Jesus. Don't think that it couldn't happen here. Let's make sure their future is as bright as ours was when it comes to our faith. Let us pray. Father, you know what you're doing. You know what you want to do here in our lives and in the lives of, of the millions in our nation and the billions in our world. Help us to be faithful to what you're calling us to do and be. You've granted us this amazing power to decide, to choose. Guide us by your Holy Spirit to make the right choices. Father, help us to see the truth. And help us to do our part. To be sure that we put people in office who will do the best job possible for us. 
Thank you, Father, for this great privilege you've given us, and thank you for this great opportunity we have to shape the future once again. Guide us now and speak to us, we pray, and help us to live this part of our Christian life out in society as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.